Coming up on episode 14 of Omnivore, using improv to better communicate science, optimizing organic acids for pathogen control, and improving disease resistance in commercial citrus crops. It's all ahead on Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by Calsac, maker of DuraShield natural food protection blends that extend the shelf life while keeping your meat or poultry products label clean. Find out more at calsac.com slash omnivore. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. In a rapidly changing world, it's never been more critical for experts to clearly communicate science and help the public discern fact from fiction. Laura Lindenfeld, Executive Director for the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science, says the key is putting yourself in the shoes of your audience. We recently spoke about how acting techniques, specifically theatrical improv, can help build better connections. Laura, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, can you briefly explain the origin story of the Alan Alda Center? What makes it unique? Alan Alda, wonderful actor, writer, director. He worked on Scientific American Frontiers. He interviewed scientists and he noticed that when he could get them to make a connection with them, they would convey their work and talk about science in ways that were so compelling and interesting. And it occurred to him, what if we used improvisational theater to help scientists communicate? And Alan being the creative genius that he is, went around the greater Northeast and looked at universities and said, hey, would you be interested in having me help train scientists? And Stony Brook University, here on Long Island, New York, where I live, said, yes, that's, let's give it a whirl. And that's how the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science was born. So talk a little bit about the underlying need that this is addressing. And, and when we were speaking about a month ago for the food technology interview, you mentioned this concept about the curse of knowledge as being a barrier for scientists to be able to effectively communicate. Can you elaborate a little bit on what that means and, and how your training addresses that? When you're trained to be an expert in something, you learn really specific language and ways of thinking and communicating about your work. And what happens is you lose distance from what it feels like not to know all that information and not be really inculcated into that culture. We call that the curse of knowledge. It sounds, it sounds scary and frightening. It's not about knowledge being bad. It's, it's really about what does it feel like not to know what you know so well? When you lose that distance, you tend to communicate about things in ways that reach the others who, who, who are experts like you, and it leaves so many people behind. So along those lines, can you talk a little bit about the role of empathy in science communication and how do these training programs foster that? Yeah, we use improvisational theater. We literally get STEM professionals, scientists in the room, and we use improvisational theater exercises to help people form connection. And to me, what's at the core of communication is not about me getting perfect words that are always going to land perfectly on you or, or on any given audience, but really for us to be able to imagine, as the experts in this case, what do others need from us so that we can have a conversation that moves ideas forward? And the way to do that is through empathy. Imagining what it feels to be someone else. Imagining what it feels to be talking to someone like me and putting myself in their shoes so that we can forge a connection and move the conversation. Can you paint a little bit of a picture of what some of these exercises look like? I mean, how does this, how does this work on a practical level? Yeah, in a practical level. So we do this in person and online. I'll, I'm going to talk about in person. Imagine you come into a room and there's 16 to 20 scientists and a couple of uh, specialists from the Alda Center who are trained to do this work. 
and we get you up on your feet and we teach you two rules. Number one, you got to say yes. And that's the first rule of improv, accept the reality of the situation and make it move forward. And we tell you, you have to make your partner look good. Whatever it is you do, whether you believe or disbelieve uh, this person, you've got to accept their humanity and dignity. And we have you doing all kinds of exercises like where you may be mirroring each other or uh, playing around with ideas. There's, there's such an element of play and joy to this whole process. And it helps you more and more throughout the day be able to put yourself empathically in the shoes of that other person and figure out ways to communicate that forge genuine connections. So you wind up learning that listening is the most important part of communication. And you learn to communicate in ways that help you be heard rather than thinking, oh, that person didn't hear me, that's their fault. So you bring these people in and you work with them over a day, a couple of days. How do you measure success or impact? Is there any kind of a follow-up mechanism or is it primarily anecdotal on site? Typically, it's a, a full day. Sometimes it's two days. Uh, the exercises are scaffolded. We talk about that in learning sciences so that things build on each other. It's like building muscles at the gym. Um, you make your biceps strong, then you make your shoulders strong, and you can lift some really heavy weights. So we build that over one to two days. How do we assess that? We get feedback about the workshops. We also have, and I I can't really share this with you yet because it's not done, but we have a large study that's looking at how does improv being used with scientists affect their ability to communicate and how do audiences then perceive that communication. So I'm going to ask you to switch gears for a second, because in addition to being executive director of the Alda Center, you're also the dean of the journalism school at Stony Brook. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the bridge between these two, because you know the world's only getting more complicated. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Can you address the role of the media in this equation within the role of the media in combating misinformation? And what, what can we be doing to better prepare these professional communicators? What I love about having the, you know, the full spectrum of communication and journalism research and practice in the school and center is that we're, we're able to help have our students here at the school learn how to produce media about science, go to experts to get stories and produce content designed for the audiences that they want to reach. One thing I think is really, really critical, and you would know this yourself, is to, to understand who are the audiences you serve? Not everybody has the same needs. And to be able to um, bring that empathy that we use in the communication training to bear on how we produce media so that the content we want to bring across, accurately vetted journalistic content and other forms of media that are really compelling, but that it really is designed to land with that, that audience so people can make sense of information and use it in their lives. I want to circle back for a second about when you were talking about the role of empathy and putting yourself in the in the shoes of the person that you're that you're speaking with. When you really take an audience seriously and you really put yourselves to the best of your ability into their shoes, you have to think about what it feels like to be them and what they might remember. People are inundated by a lot of information. I mean, how many channels and sources and messages do we get all day long? It's very easy to forget. When you're communicating to be heard, rather than communicating what you want to say, it changes how you go about that communication. It changes the content, the tone, the style. That's really what we're after. It's helping you, you know, if you're a scientist, helping you convey uh, messages in such a way that they're memorable and impactful. What's your long-term vision? How do you see the center's role evolving as the future in the future as you know public perception of science and the role of communication science continues to change? I've been thinking recently, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, what this Science is amongst the most amazing, remarkable, profound things that we as a 
civilization have created. We've created music, art, literature, and science. And I find myself thinking a lot about how music, art, literature, they're emotionally moving. Um, I listen to music and I love the music in that moment. And I want to listen to more of it. I think with science, there's a often a bit of a lift to understand the impact that science has. In my, in my vision of this work, we have a world that values science because it's wonderful and amazing and has profoundly affected who we are and what we do and how we live together on this planet. Laura Lindenfeld is the executive director of the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University and dean of Stony Brook School of Communication and Journalism. You can read our extended conversation about the fine art of science communication in the June issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment, but first, this word from our sponsor. Multiple factors can affect the shelf life of meat and poultry. High water content, storage temperatures, and processing conditions all promote microbial spoilage and the growth of pathogens. DuraShield Natural Food Protection Blends from CalSAG were designed to take those challenges head on. DuraShield blends combine antimicrobials with proven CalSAG antioxidants, like Herbalox, for a patented synergistic combination that inhibits rancidity and discoloration extending the shelf life while keeping the label clean. To protect your products and your bottom line, visit kelsack.com slash omnivore. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. For more than 5,000 years, naturally acidic foods have been combined with perishable foods to extend shelf life and enhance color, flavor, and other attributes. While there are a lot of benefits organic acids bring to product formulation and processing, there are a few challenges when applying these compounds to different food matrices. Our science and technology editor, Julie Larson Brisher, talked with food technology contributor and microbiologist, Erdwan Jalen, about why it's important for product developers to consider the variable responses of different acids. Erdwan, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Hi, Julie. Thank you for having me. Let's dive right in. Uh, you, you had a recent article in Food Technology where you talked about the various organic acids that are often used as antimicrobials, antioxidants, and preservatives in food product development and in processing. Would you give us a brief overview into the benefits of acids when you're formulating food products? Absolutely. Organic acids such as acetic, lactic, citric, and benzoic acids are added into foods to control spoilage bacteria, yeast, mold, and disease-causing pathogenic microorganisms. Um, they can be used singly or in combination with others to create a synergistic effect. Uh, organic acids are primarily used for their antimicrobial properties. However, product developers and scientists use organic acids to achieve the desired acidity, enhance taste, flavor, color, extend shelf life, and delay the oxidation of lipids and proteins during storage. You know, I, I, we've been talking a little bit on the side about how not all acids are created equal. And you've just mentioned a whole bunch of acids, not even all the acids right there. But, but what do you mean by that? Why, why are acids not all created equal? And can you give me a few examples about how that could affect the outcome when formulating or processing food products? That, that's very true. Um... The answer to this question can be twofold. Uh, first, uh, we should discuss the chemical properties of uh, organic acids. Um, most commonly used organic acids are weak acids. And when we talk about what makes an acid weak, we talk about its dissociation properties. Weak acids do not completely dissolve or dissociate into their constituent ions. They are mostly undissociated in acidic environments. 
this gives organic acid a big advantage, actually, because only the undissociated form of an organic acid crosses the cell wall of microorganisms, releases their uh, protons in this intracellular environment, and reduces the pH in the cytoplasm, which eventually causes acidification in the cell. On the other hand, at high pH levels, organic acids are already in the dissociated form and are easily repelled by the uh, microbial cell defense system before they, uh, they can enter the cell. Therefore, the lower pH has pronounced antimicrobial effects on microbiological metabolism. Each organic acid also has their own very critical uh, pH value for dissociation. At a given pH, the amount of undissociated molecules and their cell penetration capacity vary significantly among organic acids. Um, once organic acid uh, permeates this lipid bilayer, they cause two problems in the cell. They release their protons in the neutral intracellular environment, which causes the acidification in the cell. While the protons reduce the pH, the reuse of anions causes a toxic effect, toxic environment in the cell. As a result of these dissociated components, organic acid causes cellular damage, inhibit metabolic processes, and ultimately led to death of cells. So many microbial cells deploy reactions to acid stress at the expense of uh, basic metabol uh, metabolic functions, which creates additional stress on the cells and make them more, more vulnerable. So when we combine all these factors, we can determine the extent of antimicrobial activity and the differences among organic acids in food preservation. So with these differences in mind, what would you say are the top do's and don'ts when using organic acids to control pathogens in various foods or beverages, you know, when you're working in the R&D lab? Yeah, when it comes to the do's and don'ts of organic acids, I think we should start first with their effects on both safety and quality. There are many organic acids used by the food industry. In most cases, more than one acid is used in formulations. In addition to their antimicrobial properties, organic acids are used to improve organoleptic properties, such as, such as color, taste, odor, and water holding capacity and yield. Before we use any organic acid, we should first conduct the microbiological risk assessment. We need to know the pathogenic and spoilage organisms associated with that particular food formulation or any ingredient that we might be using uh, in that uh, specific formula. Uh, we also need to determine the acid resistance and acid tolerance of these target microorganisms because some of the uh, strains of uh, pathogens can be more acid resistant than the others. Uh, second, we need to determine which acid or acids we should be using to have the most effective application against those identified uh, microorganisms. Uh, as we discussed earlier, the mode of action and the extent of antimicrobial activity vary among organic acids significantly. Um, using one acid at a high concentration level may adversely affect the taste and color, and using too many acids at a low level may not achieve the safety and the quality objectives we are targeting. So um, we need to determine the balance uh, among acids and optimize the uh, usage of these uh, acids to achieve the food safety and quality objectives. Predictive models uh, can be very helpful for these purposes. Uh, we can determine the amount and the concentration of these organic acids that we might want to use in food formulations. Third, we need to determine the product characteristics such as fat, protein, moisture level, water activity, pH, even the storage temperature. Microbial inactivation and growth rates are directly affected by these factors in acidic foods. For example, high fat content 
provides a shield effect on microbial cells and therefore higher concentrations of acids may be needed compared to low-fat formulas. So what are some of the don'ts? When it comes to what we shouldn't do, we can talk about only one critical factor, which is the pH itself. We shouldn't rely only on pH. Uh, the pH level will be a, a very good start for microbiological risk assessment, but certain pathogens such as E. coli and salmonella may develop acid resistance and tolerance. This tolerance may even vary among the strains of the same pathogen. Therefore, relying on pH alone to control these pathogens may mislead researchers in determining the safety and quality of food products. Well, you just mentioned predictive modeling in your last answer, and I'm wondering, are there any other advanced methods that could help the food industry overcome like challenges of acid resistance or improve our ability to extend shelf life? Yes, absolutely. Um, whole genome sequencing is one of those technologies. It can provide higher resolution power than conventional methods and insight into acid resistance and acid tolerance. Um, using whole genome sequencing, we can determine resistant genes for antibiotic resistance, sanitizer resistance, and acid stress resistance. This is especially important when designing shelf life studies. When we conduct a shelf life study, we use the term called worst case scenario. A shelf life study should be conducted under the worst case scenario to provide the conservative results. When it comes to choosing the pathogens, we need to choose the acid resistance strains to achieve robust results uh, in the shelf life studies. Predictive microbiology is another tool used by researchers. Predictive models are computer-based software models and estimate the probability of microbial growth under specific conditions such as pH, temperature, and moisture. It provides flexibility for product developers to work on many different scenarios. In the model, we can change the acid type, concentration, pH, moisture level, even storage temperature and target pathogens to predict the microbiological stability of uh, products. Although predictive models are very useful, researchers are encouraged to run actual shelf life studies on the final formula. Oh my gosh. Well, Thanks, Erdwan, for giving us some of the valuable tips today on acids. And I I'm looking forward to seeing you at IFT first. I, I know I owe you some sushi along with maybe some pickled ginger, one of my favorite acids. That sounds uh, really good. And it has been a great pleasure, Julie. Thank you. Erdwan Jalen is Director of Scientific Affairs with Mary U Nutrisciences, and chair of IFT's Refrigerated and Frozen Foods Division. You can read more about using organic acids to improve food safety and quality outcomes in the June issue of Food Technology. For nearly 20 years, citrus greening disease has taken a devastating toll on Florida's orange groves. Fortunately, scientists at the U.S. Horticultural Research Laboratory in Fort Pierce, Florida, are working to breed orange tree hybrids that can tolerate citrus greening disease and yield oranges suitable for juice making. It's tricky work. The citrus genus is complex and the breeding process is time consuming. But researchers Dr. Ann Plato and Dr. Matthew Mattia are optimistic. In this segment with Food Technologies Mary Ellen Kuhn, they describe the process of breeding hybrids and analyzing the resulting fruit to assess its palatability. Well, I'd like to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about citrus greening disease. What exactly is it and how much of an impact has it had on growing oranges in Florida? Citrus greening has had a tremendous impact in Florida. It kind of appeared or was detected, formally detected in 2005, and it is a type of disease that is a complex um, because it is a bacteria 
transmitted by an insect vector. So the insect feeds onto the plant and inject the bacteria in the sap. Then the bacteria goes down the phloem, if you imagine goes down your, your blood vessels, and then it plugs it. It makes um, it multiplies and it, it plugs the blood vessels, so it prevents the flow of nutrients from the roots to the leaves and to the fruit. And eventually the tree dies after maybe 10 or 15 years because all the tree gets infected, the trees die. And it has impacted, Florida has almost a monoculture of oranges. They, of course, when we have a monoculture, then we have a problem. Once a disease appears, then it spreads like a wildfire and then it's a disaster. The acreage of oranges in Florida has been reduced by more than a half, and the production, the production in Florida in two in 2022, even 23, three, but 20, let's say 22 because 23 was impacted by hurricanes. The production in 22 was 16 percent of what it was before the the appearance of that disease. So yes, it is a tremendous uh, impact. There is no cure. The only salvation or and we realize now after almost 20 years of that disease, some trees are more susceptible than others. And so the only salvation is growing trees that are tolerant. Wouldn't say t resistant, but that are tolerant to the disease. So they're still infected, but they still can produce oranges. Well, thank you for that explanation. Dr. Mattia, I'm hoping you could talk a little bit about the research project. And a big part of this project involved creating hybrid citrus trees, trees that were capable of being tolerant of the disease and also producing oranges of suitable quality for making orange juice. In simple terms, could you walk us through the process of breeding hybrids? Absolutely. So the USDA has a plant breeding program that is over 100 years old. It's the oldest plant breeding program for citrus in the country, and some folks say that it's the oldest in the world. And what we've started doing for a long period of time is using a citrus relative called Tonsiris trifoliata, and using this as a parent in our breeding populations, and over time back crossing, so taking uh, this wild relative that has a lot of tolerances to diseases um, like citrus greening, and using it in hybrids that are crossed back to mandarin or sweet orange. And what this ends up, what this ends up producing over time through this conventional crossing over many generations is, um, advanced generations of plant material that have really excellent fruit quality and can tolerate the disease much better than regular true sweet orange. So we have these hybrids that we've created that we determine as orange like or hybrids that are mandarin. Um, and both of these can be used in juice to improve the juice and the juice quality, um, even though that they're completely infected with citrus greening disease. Well, thank you. So back to Dr. Plato to tell us about the next phase of the research that involves sensory testing of juice from the hybrids and also chemical analysis. What were the goals of that research and what did you learn? So as Dr. Mattia has explained, he's doing the field part. And once the tree looks good and the, the fruit looks good and, you know, preliminary testing in the field is okay, you know, it's palatable, then he brings several fruits to the lab. We juice them and we taste them by sensory evaluation and we, we analyze it chemistry, so by chemically. The most critical factors are the sugars and acids, but also the volatile components and the non-volatile components that are, can impart bitterness. And uh, this is where citrus is very complicated because um, the, the interaction of all the volatile components and non-volatile components uh, can, can really produce it is very complicated in citrus because also we have oil from the peel that can get into the juice and add some mouth feel. And this is why um, what we what we were trying to do in the in the research and we're continuously doing that research is trying to identify what are the chemical drivers of taste qualities. 
And what did we learn is that there are bitter components that are well known, but there are also other components that do taste bitter or will impart some relative bitterness and that are still not known. So we're still working on that part. Well, Dr. Mattia, do you want to talk us through the next steps in the research process? Sure, absolutely. I think from a field standpoint, what we're working on is creating hybrids that are more tolerant to disease. As Anne mentioned, the disease has been in Florida since 2005, and we've made crosses with the information uh, as the disease pressure has increased with the state. And so now we're in a high disease pressure environment, and we can use this to screen our materials quickly and to provide solutions in the form of new tolerant um, orange-like or mandarin trees that the industry can use in their juice chain. Well, given this complexity, are you optimistic that you'll be able to breed citrus trees that produce juice that is both tolerant to citrus greening disease and also tastes good? Absolutely. Um, I think that we've already made progress in this area. Um, a lot of the research that's been generated on the juice quality side by Anne has definitely shown that there is an ability to produce improve orange juice and produce orange juice with a, with a higher, um, with, with higher quality. And on the tree side, uh, we've produced 45,000 hybrids uh, that are focused toward this effort. The difficult thing I will compliment is that um, the processors or the consumer has been used to have a very uniform orange juice. When they see orange juice, they know what it will taste like. And as Matt explained, they, all these oranges, they come from just a very narrow genetic base. Whereas if we start breeding and, and bringing material from other crops, and mandarin is a good example because mandarins, a lot of mandarins have shown to have some tolerance to, to uh, citrus greening. And mandarins taste really good, but they are not oranges. And so when they, they don't juice the same way, you have other characters that show up that they are not like oranges, and so it is. It will be. Uh, it will be the responsibility, I would say, of the juice companies to know how they will market those. It's. It will be a new juice, I believe, not orange juice, but a citrus juice that will still taste very good, but that will not be the exact same juice as we know it. That's interesting. Good, but different. Anne Plato is a plant physiologist, and Matthew Mattia is a research geneticist. Both work with the U.S. Horticultural Research Laboratory in Fort Pierce, Florida, part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Research Service. You can learn more about their work to breed disease-resistant citrus in the June issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, CalSAC. Protecting your products and your bottom line with DuraShield Natural Food Protection Blends. Learn more at kelsack.com slash omnivore. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine, or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.